Maintaining dense, healthy bent grass when heat, humidity, and rounds per day are at their peak can be stressful for you and the turf. Developing a season-long plan based on good cultural practices, a solid understanding of plant physiology, and well-timed fungicide applications is critical to sustaining optimum turf quality. Dr. Turjan, why are measures for reducing environmental stress so important in turf grass management? Well, turf grasses have a, a natural resistance uh, or tolerance to environmental stresses, but when those stress levels um, rise above a certain threshold, then there oftentimes is a, a measurable deterioration in the quality of the turf. For example, uh, temperature and moisture stresses can be mitigated by some adjustments in the cultural program, including mowing, irrigation, fertilization, uh, and cultivation practices. Uh, severe temperature stress um, sometimes can be reduced by uh, raising the mowing height just a short amount to provide a somewhat larger plant that's going to be more stress tolerant. Uh, where uh, moisture stress is severe resulting in wilting, a light syringing with water can replenish the moisture in the leaves and also cool the plant and enable it to get through a day when it otherwise might not. What environmental factors contribute to turf grass stress? Uh, there are a number of environmental factors that can uh, substantially contribute to stress. There are atmospheric factors such as light or actually the absence of it, uh, moisture, oftentimes the absence of it, uh, temperature extremes or excessive wind speeds. There are soil related factors. Um, uh, including the um, uh, availability of water and nutrients from the soil or the absence of sufficient oxygen in the soil which is essential for uh, nutrient and water uptake. There are even biotic factors such as the intensity of traffic to which the turf is subjected. So all of those can individually or collectively be uh, quite stressful to a turf grass. Does soil compaction from traffic adversely affect turf grass growth and turf quality? Well, recall that the soil is the growth medium for a turf grass community and the soil is also a reservoir for the water and the nutrients that plants need for healthy growth. Now, also necessary in the soil is sufficient oxygen, or what we call aeration capacity. In the absence of adequate soil oxygen, the plant's ability to take up the water and nutrients that it needs is impaired. And so, uh, turf grass managers will do uh, or employ a number of cultivation practices to improve soil aeration and therefore enhance the plant's ability to secure from the soil the water and nutrients that it needs for healthy turf grass growth. Why is this such an important factor affecting turf grass growth and turf quality? Plants, as you know, photosynthesize. That means they create food uh, from, at, from carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and from water obtained from the soil. And they convert carbon dioxide and water to carbohydrates and oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthetic activity. Um, in order to have photosynthesis and the production of food, you have to have light. And as the light intensity increases, the amount of photosynthetic activity up to a point increases as well. Now, um, during the day, plants photosynthesize, but they don't photosynthesize at night when there's no light. And so clearly the amount of photosynthesis required must be sufficient not only to get the plant through the day, but to get it through the night as well. So it has to produce more than is necessary just to compensate for respiration. In addition, um, a plant must produce additional carbohydrates to compensate for the losses due to natural senescence. Um, as a new leaf emerges uh, from a turf grass shoot, an older leaf dies, maintaining a relatively constant number of leaves per shoot. Will it compensate for the loss of, of plant tissue and degenerate new plant tissue? You need a level of food production or photosynthetic activity for that purpose. In addition, if there's disease or injury, then the turf grass community must recover from that. And so in order to sustain adequate recuperative capacity, that requires an additional increment of net photosynthetic activity. 
And finally, we know that a plant's stress tolerance is a reflection of the level of carbohydrate reserves in storage tissues. And so you need a level of photosynthetic activity over and above what we talked about already to produce those carbohydrate reserves that are then uh, predispose the plant to be more stress tolerant. So we need uh, enough photosynthetic activity to get through the night, to compensate for losses due to natural senescence, to provide for recovery from a disease or injury, and to provide an adequate level of carbohydrate reserves for enhanced stress tolerance. So, shaded turf suffers strictly from the extent to which light intensity is reduced. Yes, shaded turf suffer because there's inadequate photosynthetic activity for all of the things that I just mentioned. Uh, enough to get through the night when there is no photosynthesis, enough to compensate for losses due to natural senescence, enough to um, compensate for uh, damage or disease, and enough to provide an adequate level of carbohydrate reserves. Is there a difference between the effects of morning shade and afternoon shade? Now, in the early morning hours, uh, temperatures are cool and the photorespiration rate is relatively low. And so net photosynthesis occurs at a fairly efficient rate. Another advantage of the early morning hours is the previous day the plant had perhaps may have been subjected to considerable amount of temperature and drought stress and so it may go into the nighttime under stress. But during the uh, course of the evening hours, it, um, it picks up additional moisture from the soil and it's no longer transpiring. And so in the early morning hours, the plant's in much better shape physiologically. It's not under moisture stress. And so the stomates in the leaves are wide open. They're available, they're available for rapid exchange of, of uh, atmospheric gases and, and gases within the plant. And so the overall photosynthetic mechanism proceeds very, very efficiently. If you shade the plant in the early morning hour, you obviate that advantage that's specific to the early morning hours. Now, if that shade were to occur in the afternoon, remember in the afternoon, temperatures are higher and photorespiration is, a, is at a much higher rate and net photosynthesis is reduced. Also, the plant is under moisture stress at that time of the day. So afternoon shade may actually be beneficial as long as it's not too severe and that it provides some protection against excessive temperatures and uh, drought stress. So if you're going to have shade, it's much better to have it in the afternoon. It's especially bad to have it in the morning when conditions would otherwise be very, very favorable for a very efficient photosynthetic activity. Having full sun available in the early morning hours takes advantage of the combination of stress-free plants and high rates of net photosynthesis. Therefore, morning shade effectively eliminates these advantages? Absolutely. Morning sun is absolutely essential for healthy plants because that's the time when net photosynthetic activity is at its most efficient and the plants in the best physiological condition to take full advantage of it. During the summer months especially, why is spoon feeding a fertilizer so important? Remember during the summer months, um, the plant, um, is, uh, the temperatures are high and the plant is under uh, both uh, temperature and moisture stress. And uh, photorespiration is at a relatively high level so that net photosynthesis is relatively low. That is, it's relatively inefficient photosynthetically. So one has to be careful that the application of nitrogen and other nutrients is not at a rate that is excessive relative to the net photosynthetic rate. You want to control the amount of uh, nitrogen and other nutrients so that they're adequate to maintain healthy growth, but not excessive that can actually uh, exacerbate the carbohydrate stress that normally occurs in the summertime. So spoon feeding provides that level of control. One can supply nitrogen at perhaps a tenth of a pound to an eighth of a pound per thousand square feet to try to optimize the response of the turf grass to that nutrient. If it's too little, growth may not be at the level that it should be. Uh, and if it's too much, then that can exacerbate carbohydrate stress. So spoon feeding provides the turf grass manager manager with the ability to control that at exactly the amount the plant needs for healthy growth.
wouldn't the use of slowly available nitrogen carriers also reduce the potential for excessive nitrogen uptake and these associated effects? One would think that a so-called controlled release uh, nitrogen formulation would mimic the spoon feeding that, uh, that is so popular today, but the reality is that many of the nitrogen carriers in use today release based on temperature. The higher the temperature, the faster the release rate. And so if you accumulate a lot of these uh, carriers in the soil and then they suddenly release under high summer temperatures, you could actually be overstimulating the plants with excessive nitrogen. And so in that respect, the so-called control release materials may not be acting in, the, in, in a way that is uh, uh, optimum for uh, turf grass growth and health. So no, it's very, very difficult to mimic what you can do with uh, spoon feeding. What is the effect of temperature, moisture, and nitrogen on new turf grass leaf emergence and longevity? To understand the effects of uh, temperature, moisture, and nitrogen on uh, turf grass growth, one needs to understand the fact that um, new leaves emerge and older leaves die. And so in a turf grass plant, there's continual replacement of old tissue with new tissue. Now in a, uh, in a uh, green composed of creeping bent grass and annual bluegrass, that new leaf emergence rate occurs at about every 5.5 to 6.5 days. So in other words, about every six days, a new leaf emerges and an older leaf dies off, maintaining a relatively constant number of leaves per shoot. Okay? So if you're applying a fungicide that works by covering the foliage and protecting it from infecting disease organisms, you need to be sure to cover that new growth as it emerges. And that's why frequent application of contact fungicides is so important to compensate for the emergence of new unprotected tissue. How often should a contact fungicide, such as chlorothalonil, be applied to ensure effective control of dollar spot and other diseases? Um, contact fungicides like chlorothalonil should be applied on a seven-day basis to get optimum control out of them. As Dr. Turgeon has already explained, a new leaf emerges every 5.5 to 6.5 days. So in order to adequately cover the existing tissue as well as the emerging tissue, uh, weekly programs with contact fungicides are the most efficient way to apply them. Does weekly fungicide application offer any other advantages to the turf grass manager? One of the advantages is most golf courses uh, use a spoon type feeding program during the summertime on uh, creeping bent grass and you bluegrass greens. Uh, this allows them to have better control of the growth of the turf as Dr. Turgeon already spoke about. In addition, since you're applying the contact fungicide on a weekly basis also, these two applications can be combined into one. With respect to application equipment, how should contact fungicides be applied to ensure optimum disease control? My research shows that contact fungicides work best when applied with a flat fan nozzle. Also, it's important the amount of water to use. Somewhere between 0.5 and 2 gallons per thousand square feet works best when applying a contact fungicide like chlorothalonil. Is there a danger of disease inciting fungus developing resistance to chlorothalonil from weekly applications? Uh, one of the nice things about uh, using chlorothalonil on a weekly basis is you do not have to worry about resistance developing. Uh, chlorothalonil has been around since the late 60s, uh, used on many crops including turf, and no fungus has ever developed resistance to the chlorothalonil. Is there a benefit from the inclusion of the green pigment found in ECHO ETQ? My research has shown that the green pigment ETQ improves the quality of the turf compared to the chlorothalonil uh, without any green pigment in it. And there has been a significant increase in the quality of the turf, whether it was creeping bent grass or any grass. To what do you attribute this improvement in turf quality? Uh, the improvement in turf quality with uh, the green pigment uh, has been uh, suggested to be due to the uh, pigment.
pigment protecting the plant from the ultraviolet rays, which increases the number of chloroplasts within the plant, therefore increasing photosynthesis. It's also been shown to cool the surface of the plant. Obviously, if the surface of the leaf is cool, the plant's going to have a better chance of surviving the summer stress period. And finally, it has been shown to be an increase in the trans rate of transpiration. Again, another process by which the plant cools itself. Um, I believe these three things all come together to make the turf healthier during the summer stress period. Why is light important to turf grass? Light drives photosynthesis and it's crucial for turf grass growth and development. Without it, turf grass will not regenerate and recover from wear and tear, also from mowing from a regular daily maintenance schedule. Um, the light, is, light energy is converted into chemical energy in the form of ATP and this is required for the production of new growth. Does light vary or is it just one wavelength? Light is energy. Uh, it's measured in wavelengths and each of the colors that we see have a different wavelength. The energy that's associated with one color is not the same as another color and in saying that red light has a longer wavelength than blue light thus it has a lower energy level associated with it. How does this affect plants? Plants absorb different wavelengths. They have preferences for the different wavelengths and light colors. We know this because green light is reflected and we know that blue and red light in particular are absorbed. There are other wavelengths that are involved that we cannot see with our eyes and they may have higher or lower energy levels associated with them and thus they may have an effect on the plant growth and development also. These are beneficial to turf grass plants? Too much light is not necessarily a good thing. There is a higher amount of energy associated with it. If a plant cannot convert this energy quick enough, there is a buildup in heat and the amount of energy in the leaf surface. Ultraviolet light can enhance the effect. This is known as generally as photoinhibition and it leads to internal production of higher energy compounds which can damage cell walls, chlorophyll pigmentation and also lead to mutations in the DNA. Is the plant capable of protecting itself? Plants do contain compounds which have the capability to absorb extra light energy, reducing the stress on the chlorophyll pigmentation. Carotenoids have the capability to absorb in the 400 to 500 nanometer range, while flavonoids actually have the capability to absorb light in the ultraviolet light range. Plants also have repair mechanisms which are enzymatically driven and will kick into effect once the damage has started to occur. How effective are these compounds? They offer protection in certain situations and this is due to their light absorbing characteristics. We do see this at certain times of the year such as late fall where we may still have higher sunlight and lower temperatures. A reduced rate of photosynthesis thus occurs and then we have a heat buildup. Pigments such as certain specific type of flavonoids have the ability to sit on top of the chlorophyll pigmentation and reduce the impact of this damage. The plant may require extra energy to produce these compounds. They do contain quite high levels of carbon and thus there is maybe a requirement for the plant to change its allocation of resources, however. With repeated stress, the pigments may also break down and lose their effectiveness over time. Is this a serious issue? The effect of ultraviolet light is predicted to increase in the northern hemisphere to its highest extent in the next 10 years. There is also variability where we see different light intensities at different times of the day, at different locations in the country, and in different locations around the globe. That being the case, there is always potential for overheating or photoinhibition to chlorophyll pigmentation in the turf grass plant. Cloud cover, time of day, time of year all play a role in the reflective and absorption characteristics of light. The ozone layer which surrounds the Earth's atmosphere has also played a crucial role in ultraviolet light absorption. This layer, however, has decreased in its thickness in recent times and recently, even in the Northern Hemisphere, a hole has been found in the ozone layer, thus allowing much larger volumes of ultraviolet light into the Earth's atmosphere and hitting off the surface. Is ultraviolet light the biggest light issue on turf grasses? Ultraviolet light will not cause large-scale damage due to short-term exposure. However, in the northern United States, on a daily basis, visible light in the 400 to 700 nanometer range does cause photoinhibition. The amount of energy that hits a turf grass leaf surface on a daily basis is actually more than the plant requires 
and thus leads to heating of the leaf surface and some degradation and reduction in photosynthetic activity. Is there anything that can be done? Use of certain grasses that may have different light absorption characteristics such as thicker cuticles may offer one option, while biotechnology and breeding may also offer another option in an effort to increase the production of protective pigments within the leaf surface. The simplest option right now may be to use a pigment or dye to sit on the turf grass leaf surface in an effort to reflect or absorb some of the light and reduce the impact of temperatures and light on the chlorophyll pigmentation and internal structures in the leaf. How would this work? The dye could either absorb the light directly or it could also, depending on its chemical makeup, offer an ability to reflect the light from the leaf surface and back into the atmosphere. These two options would reduce the amount of light hitting the leaf surface directly, thus offering an ability to reduce the amount of photo inhibition and also possibly offering an opportunity to reduce the temperature buildup within the leaf itself. Are there any concerns? The dye needs to be able to absorb enough light to reduce the damage to the turf grass leaf. It also needs to have the ability not to cause a shading situation. The dye could also be beneficial if it helped to reduce the heat load on the turf grass plant while also allowing the plant to maintain photosynthetic rates and retaining chlorophyll pigmentation. The only other concern is that the dye may need to be applied on a regular basis to optimize its capabilities. Applied in accordance with the bent grass growth cycle, Echo ETQ fungicides are an important two-for-one tool for disease protection and turf grass quality. Applying Echo ETQ at the correct rate and frequency maximizes results. On bent grass turf during the summer season, where a plant mode at putting green height may have just three leaves, with the oldest being only 18 days old, applying Echo ETQ every 7 to 14 days is recommended. This assures consistent fungicidal and pigment technology protection, which in turn promotes optimum turf grass protection.